this is really about a, 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 a Indian guru. And the Indian, well, you know them say Ayatollah is dead in a 1975. Yes, I think 1975. Well, this Indian guru say he met Ayatollah Selassie twice. And one of the times them that he met him was in 1984, 85. Which is like 10 years after them say Ayla Selassie died. He wrote a book and document this visit or this meeting with Ayla Selassie. The book is called Wings to Freedom. This is a Indian guru we are talking about. For those of you who don't know who an Indian guru is, <laughs> I can't but I explain it. Trust me, I want to play the thing. You understand? So you have to go find out who is a guru in the Indian tradition. But it's this man him write a book named Wings of Freedom. And as I say, he documents this meeting with Eilis Lassie. Even after the time that they claim that Ayla Selassie passed away. So we're going to play an excerpt from the book. In his own words, this is this guru speaking. It was a bleak autumn morning in London. I had just gotten out of my routine meditation when all of a sudden some friends of my host visited. They were very excited and told us that His Majesty, the Emperor of Ethiopia, had heard of my experiential yoga teaching and had expressed a desire to see me, a yogi from India. El Salasi, thrice great, from the house of Sheva was also called the conquering lion of Judah the same title held by King David in the Bible Selassie was 225th in descent from the line of King Solomon soon we were driving along in my disciples Austin Cambridge our guides who had established contacts with the house of Ethiopia were very happy to be party to this great meeting I was told to keep this meeting a secret because His Majesty was a guest of the Royal Family of England and for all practical purposes to the African and Rastafarian religious communities he was thought to have left his bodily abode in 1975. However, this was untrue as I recall meeting with him seven years later in 1982. Our guides took us to the residence on Great Portland Street. He stopped the car and entered a mansion-like home. There were two robust and ruddy men, all smiles, sitting at the reception. Scotland Yard detectives, I presumed. My guess was right, as they simply told us who they were when we introduced ourselves. He was obviously given the highest security of the land since the king was a guest of the now late Queen Mary. The gentleman led us up a broad red carpeted stairway to a simple but tastefully decorated parlor with soft green furniture and carpet. The green room of the palace, I said to myself. I was used to all this green and pink rooms which were there at our own house in India. The butler came and asked us, if he would like something to drink, but we declined. We waited for Hail Selassie, the king about whom my grandfather had told me many stories. It is said that Hail Selassie 
was a visiting board member of the League of Nations. This was the international organization before the United Nations had formed. During an international meeting, a miscreant drew a pistol to shoot the king. He did not move, but steadily looked the murderer directly in the eyes. Consequently, the man dropped his pistol and was led away by the security guards. After about a 20-minute wait, His Majesty the King entered. We all stood up and bowed. He responded to our bows and bade us sit down. He was accompanied by his grandson, a very impressive person, seven feet tall and about 25 years of age. He was introduced to us as Prince Yaqub, pronounced Yaqub, as in Hebrew. He had completed his military studies in the National Defense Academy in Pune, my hometown in India. When pleasantries had been exchanged, cakes and pastries eaten, His Majesty arose and so did we all, according to the royal protocol. He went into his inner chamber and requested me to follow. As we sat opposite one another, I had the opportunity to have a deeper look at him. He was about 90 years of age. His eyes were aglow with the experience of life. His stoic head was held steady on his sturdy shoulders. His hair was curly and white as snow. When I peered into his heart, I saw his truly majestic and lion soul. Oh, what a sight. What a man. Truly great men do not have to show what they are. They are what they are, I thought. I was 38 years of age then. He asked me if I could perform a havan, a fire ceremony for him and his family. I consented to do so but told him of the smoke which may cause a fire alarm to go off. He made all the arrangements and also informed the Scotland Yard security guards. And so we got underway preparing for the sacred fire ceremony. I told the king that in ancient times Around 7000 BC, a great king from India called Mahandata had performed a stupendous havan in the Congo Basin in Africa. This was mentioned in the Purans, of course. It's a metaphorical saying that the sand in many parts of the Congo resembles holy ash. However, it is interesting to note that it does appear that that sand is the remnant of an ancient fire ceremony performed by the King Mahandata. He showed a great interest in ancient history and told me that there was a trade via the Silk Road between Ethiopia and India before Cleopatra's time. It was during the time of the Queen Sheba of Ethiopia that Africa learnt a lot of the spiritual law and spiritual techniques from India. This was later passed on from Ethiopia to the Egyptians. I was deeply intrigued to hear this from the king, who himself was a deeply spiritual and divine soul. In India we call such a soul a Mahatma or a great soul, like Mahatma Gandhi. Such souls visit our earth rarely. Many interesting things I learned that day from this great king sage who reminded me of the ancient king Janak of the Ramayana. I told him that Bhim, the pand of a prince and cousin of Lord Krishna had married a girl called Hedamba from Ethiopia. As we talked, all the preparations for the fire ceremonies were made. The clarified butter, the rice, etc., I then proceeded to perform the havan for the welfare of humanity and for spiritual progress to all. The sacred flames of the fire ceremony danced to the chanting of mantras. All those present were engulfed in the holy ambience as we rejoiced in the spirit of the Lord. After the sacred ceremony was over, His Majesty was very touched. He and the Queen then showed me what they needed to show me. As 
I passed through their bedchamber, I looked at him and his majestic bed. I thought it to be made of platinum or white gold, but did not ask him. The royal bed was so huge with its curtains that I mistook it for another smaller chamber. Upon his showing an interest in the science of yoga, I gave to him the yogic hamsa breathing technique, which he practiced successfully. Six months later, he telephoned me in India and told me of the spiritual well-being and sound sleep he was able to have after practicing the technique. Yes, from the wings of freedom. You know, years ago when the studio did the up, uh, upstairs here and Willie well, Powers used to come through them, say them here about the country. There. You know, a woman passed through the studio here and I did a talk to her on the radio and she said to me, American daughter, and she said, she have a picture for give me. And I say, okay. She said, when she go out fire, she will send it back. But more time I want to tell me that, I just say, all right, I don't know nothing. Well, I want to tell you, say, months after you know, I get an envelope down here, when I, when I open the envelope, you know, I see this picture. Because she said, it's a very unique picture. I see this picture with Ayla Selassie and this guru cross a table. And I see Ayla Selassie almost like him bow. To this guru and when I look upon the guru him ear almost like it a locks up like him want to look more like a, a, a what them call them a sadhu in a India but I remember I, as I get the picture I go down at the place and put it in this plastic and up to this day I have this picture here well you know, say, Sister Carol just called me a while ago and I explained this picture to me. Say, she have a picture for me. And she explained the picture. I said, but I the same picture me have for years now. And she said, yeah, the same guru attack on the tape. The same guru attack on the tape. So we never can tell. So the question is, the question is this. Why would an Indian guru declare such a message meeting Ayla Selassie? And why would he say for a tape in a book that a lot of ones believe that Ayla Selassie passed away in 1975? But he declares that he met Ayla Selassie in 1982. Why would an Indian guru say this? Not having no connection to this man, not accepting where Rasta say about Ayla Selassie, and now eventually later down the line, actually documented his meeting with Ayla Selassie in a book called Wings of Freedom. Really, something to think about. So you know, so my brains are going through all the things and I remember in 1975, we used to live at Red Hills. And we had go home on the bus. And the man, when them say, I just lost it dead. It's the, it's the wickedest mocking, the wickedest mocking thing. I mean, as some of you know, say, really and truly, the people, them stay away because the same people, them were praise you, the same people were curse you. Rasta, you got dead, what you got to do now? I mean, you got cut off on the dirty locks now. See, they only got dead. I mean, some serious, serious mocking business, you know. 
You go out in a carnation market, you know. Rasta, what are you going to do now? No, God dead now. No, God dead. And the establishment did believe, say, this news did I go just get rid of Rasta once and for all in out of Jamaica. This scourge. These weird looking people. Them did believe, say, 76, 77, you wouldn't see no more Rasta in Jamaica. Because we got dead. But guess what? From 1975 until now, how much years that? You have some youth rise up as or now. Where maybe never ever see a picture of Ayla Selassie. Who come terrible upon Rome, you know. That we still there are so a declare Emperor Ayla Selassie. In a all day, we is where them want to claim and talk about we as fool, fool, idiot. What kind of stupid reasoning that want to get them foolishness there from and them thing there. Rasta rise over the years to become a force to be reckoned with. That now them tell we say Rastafari is one of the so-called religions in Jamaica that is increasing in numbers. Not decreasing like the Anglican Church and the Roman Catholic Church, but increasing to the point of 20% increase. That is them statistics. So this is after them done tell you, say, Rasta, you got dead, where you got do? I remember years ago, a man writing at the paper said, it's time Rastafari stopped this foolishness because Silasia is dead from 1975. I made it after answer because I said, brethren, 1975? Your God dead from 2,000 years ago. Are <laughs> you still appraise him? So, what is the problem? Because if you can come up with your intellect, if you say, really, it's time Rasta stop this foolishness now. I listen to dead from 1975. Are you now reflect, say, for over, two, for over 2,000 years, you are celebrate a man who is dead, where you claim to come back, where the man them who write about him in a dead Bible believes he will come back. Paul, the, the mouthpiece of Christianity, did believe that Jesus will come back. Where Paul himself never even meet this man yet, but him write so much about this man, even more than the man himself in the Bible. That the most of Christian belief and philosophy is based upon half of Pauline doctrine and Paul right as if him no say Jesus Christ was going to come back and guess what for the past 2000 years man I worship this man with them claim say raised from the dead and him will come back to judge the living and the dead and him no come back so who is you if you come tell hi must stop the foolishness. Which foolishness you are talking about? Who for foolishness? <laughs> Who for foolishness? Because when we look upon where the Western world have to offer politically and spiritually, we look upon that with scorn and disdain. We look upon it with scorn and disdain, man. We as African people, who was taken from Africa, not by free will, but by force, and brought here domiciled on this farmer's slave plantation island and many islands like these. And now we see a lot of these slaves become so comfortable with them position that them venture into these slave masters' house and become so happy, happy slaves in the slave master house. We're talking about Britain and America and other connecting rooms. And we still look upon the conditions of African people in this part of the world and in Africa. And we are saying, we're not get redeemed yet. 
That's why me know say when I talk about world I go end. Jesus now come nowhere. And if Jesus ever come, he might go wait till black people get some salvation upon the earth yeah. materially. Spiritually. We can't go, go down so after we go through some tribulations and trials for four hundred years. And we still down at the bottom of the pit. I try to rise up yourself and I try to bring forth a certain level of consciousness. You're going to tell me, say, one well, man is going to come and destroy the earth and take up whom take up and black people not get them due reward. Not like that, can't go so. Me, I declare that black people, African people, I forgot to find some joy and happiness in this life. We have to find so. Can my ancestors die? Blood, sweat, and tears help to build most of these communities that is now oppressing us all over the world. In France, in England, Liverpool to be precise, in America, and the Caribbean. Our ancestors help to build those places and only thing we gave was our blood, sweat, and tears. And a guy going to tell me, say, world are going to end and we not get no joy in this life here yet. No, Rasta. The brother there have to go wait. You have to go wait. No destruction of earth. And taking up in no rapture. Not taking place until African people get some part of the pie. We have to get some part of the pie. I mean, not talking about individually. We are talking about collectively. Just like how Europe is run by Europeans and China is run by Chinese people. We need some form of deliverance, not in the next life. We're not talking about no next life, we are talking about this life. Because everybody else are getting paid in a this life. And we are told that our reward is in heaven. And none of the people them we are telling you that never got heaven yet. All of the people them where you are talking where you are talking about your reward is in heaven. None of them never got there yet. So a speculation. We they are so right now, right in at this time yeah. Our children are born, and our children children will born, and most of us who is living now. When our children, children grow big, we will not be here. We will all go on to the earth. And what you tell me, say no. My children, children will not get any joy and happiness living on this planet because there is a man going to come back to come sweep with the whole thing and give us better living after we die. So, oh, everybody else get their reward in this life. And we have to go wait till we're dead. What kind of philosophy that? What kind of doctrine that they might teach the people then? Oh, black people suck up them the doctrine they saw. That when you look on the earth, when you look on the, the movement and the advancement of other peoples, we see them economically, them so economically up there that them is now coming down. <laughs> them don't get where them I get already. So if them get all the glory of life, where them choose, forget already. And now them are, them are step down. Who's going to be up there? You know, she say, are we, are we African people? No reach nowhere. We are talking about collectively. We are not talking about individually. We are talking about collectively, like how Europe collectively reap the benefits of what this life is supposed to be offering. You have individual Europeans who don't know what is it to be rich. You have individual Europeans in Europe who don't know what good life is. But collectively, at them run the world. At them run this world. 
So if the European them run the world and economically advanced and is now looking to not look even look into it, but the cards are now moving and the, the earth and the planet is now moving in a different direction so it has shake up certain things. So which part African people stand in the whole of that? Where I tell me say now? So you have a little guy sitting down in the sky a wait to destroy this whole planet and black people not get them due reward in a this life. No Rasta. Jesus, you have to go wait little, you know. Believe you me, you have to go wait little. It can't work that way there. Cannot work that way there. I refuse to accept. Say, everything I go crash. And we who go through slavery, the most atrocity that has ever been placed against human beings. African people go through the worst kind of atrocity. And it's still going through the atrocity. When we look on places like E.T., when we look like on places like the Congo, when we look on places like Uganda, when we look on places like Jamaica, we can't say salvation coming in the morning. <laughs> it does come so. Because right now, a black people them put against black people for maintain them power. So you have a thing named white supremacy that is not vi people them put against black people for maintain them power. So you have a thing named white supremacy that is not visible to the Jamaican or to the Caribbean people, but it exists. And if you don't believe me, check the holidays them on your calendar and see how much holidays that we create for ourselves. Check how we look and how we dress. Check what we eating and what we wearing. And you see, say, we don't have no say in anything. Check the language we speak. God, the language that you speak decide how you think. So if we, as African people, now recognize, say, the thing no work out properly. And we have to make it work out. And we're not going to make it work out if we sit down and talk about our reward is in heaven. Which reward you're looking for in heaven? Where is heaven? You know, you're the Pope. The Pope of Rome. The one before this, Benedict, Pope Paul. The Pope of Rome, the Vicar of Christ on earth, means uh, him is a representative of Jesus Christ on earth. The Pope of Rome says that heaven and hell is not a physical place. I am quoting him. I am quoting the Pope. The Pope says heaven and hell is not a physical place. And he must know he have a direct connection with Jesus. So if the Pope has said heaven and hell is not a physical place, where we are look for for God there? Where we are go? When man are talking about him, I go to heaven and who righteous go to heaven now? who wicked go to hell. Where am I talking about? Go to which hell? Which hell? Which part of hell there? Hell is not a physical place. Black people go through hell every day. Black people. Every day. Mumma, Pupa, Pikni go through hell. Every day. And if you have GPS to work with, I'm more hell. And if you have them your kind of government, I'm more hell. So we is not alien to hell. Hell is a condition. Just like heaven. And we have that facing us continuously. Two door, heaven and hell. It just that sometimes the door of hell open up power so much. Because we look and we are going to Jamaica now. May I tell you, man. Knock, knock, knock. Who is there? Come in. This is hell. Hell is not a physical place. Hell is organized in such a way to affect your physical well-being. <laughs> that is really what it is. It is organized. It is structured in a way to manipulate your conscience and your consciousness. So when you have joy in your life, there's something out there that bongs upon it 
and make the joy become sadness. It's a terrible thing. And some people go to church and believe that them can revitalize them energy. Not remembering that after them leave the church door and the church building, the school fees still have to pay and the light bill have to pay and the water rate have to pay and the man gone with the next woman out there and your picnic can't find because you're afraid now said it done gone with her and all them things there. Wow. What a serious thing. Wake up a time on a stop dream about heaven and hell. Where we are dream about heaven and hell for we are we are experiencing this right here upon earth. We don't have to go nowhere for experience heaven and hell. Right here it there. Believe you me. As the man said, time alone and time will tell. You think you're in heaven, but you're living in hell. Hell is a configuration of the human mind. Just like heaven, just like God, just like the devil. All of these things was created by man. Not woman, man. All of them, heaven, hell, God, devil, righteous and righteous. It is all man's doing and undoing. Everything we claim that him give to a, a different entity is him. It originate from. It emanate from him. The devil, God, all of them emanate from man energy. So when you hear a man and say, the devil this and the devil that, really and truly, if you really check where I talk about, it's really some man action. And if you start talking about God, you see, it's some man action. Because you have some man that go to him bed and I pray. And him feel say him have something out there. We are help him, which is really his film condition. You have some man that tell you about God going to strike you dead. And really, I'll show him that he's glad to if a lightning leak in of he says, see there, yeah, man. I God gotta show him a sign. <laughs> a terrible thing. A terrible thing, you know. But if you got to say, boy, I hope you win a, a God, a God, I hope God make you win a million dollars tomorrow for help your family and your friend, you know. I ever win the million dollar man, him vex. <laughs> he vex. You know, see it? So it's a conditioning, them condition way over the years. And really and truly, we buy into the condition. One side of it is political and one side of it is religious. But the two of them are emanated from the same source. It's like Greek mythology with the Cyclops, with the two head. I don't know if you ever see them Greek mythological animal, but you have some Greek mythology there. You have, you, you, as a matter of fact, the Greek mythology show you some serious, what you call, symbols. That is, 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 is when you get big and you start to go into it, you say, oh man, I use symbols to recreate himself. Not himself physically, but himself internally. So when you hear a man, when you see a man, I'll create a, a, a cyclops. And I can't bother explain what cyclops is. <laughs> I can't bother explain what cyclops is tonight. So you have to go figure it out. Go in at some CYC yellow PS. And go figure it out. But the cyclops, sometimes have one head with an eye in the middle of forehead. And then you have the two head man. And then you have the wickedest one, serious thing, name the Gorgon, Medusa the Gorgon. Now Medusa the Gorgon in a Greek mythology is a very interesting phenomena in the human condition. Because this is a woman who her ear is snake. So we're going to send you now if you go really go in at your computer now. Like I look at you to meet at Devon house. So I'm looking at you meet at Devon house and I'm saying, well, I'm going to tell you the truth. You know, you know, say, 
the only thing me used to use my computer for is like to listen to music and here we are going in the music design that, that and that. I make me go in at the, the, the computer one day go look for something and from that me get addicted now. Me I look for things, educational things. So that is good. So we are saying you go to the computer again now. We are telling about this Greek mythological woman named the Gorgon, Medusa the Gorgon. And who she is, is a woman who her ear is pure snake, living snake, me I talk about. And whenever somebody look on her, them turn to stone. So you have to make sure, say, you don't look on her. Because if your eye catch your eye, you turn to stone. That is the mythology. That this woman, she always forget with her enemies, or anybody who she want to get with her, she makes sure, say, you can't see her. And when you look at her in her eyes, you turn to stone. So all them going to get rid of her now is this, this man who is going to hunt her. And all, and this is very, this is very important because this is a, this is a mythology of highest proportion when it comes on to the human endeavors, human spirit. That this man, I remember name again, Odysseus, or I think it's Odysseus. Or, anyway, I don't remember the name of the man, but when do him go in a, him, him go in a cave where she live, and just imagine this woman who. Really and truly, if you look on her, you're going to turn to stone, you know. But this man now, he have a shield and a sword. And he's going to the cave to go on this woman. And when though, it's very, 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 very serious. The woman, I look on him. With the intention, say, him go look back for her. And him take him shield. And hold it in front of him. That's the woman, the gag, the medusa. Look on the shield and see herself in the shield. And turn to stone. And that is how one man get rid of medusa. That she see her own reflection. In the shield and turn to stone. Now, there is a serious story behind that mythology. Very serious story behind the mythology. That's why sometimes I tell you upon this program, say, more time for understand African history, you have to go into European history. And a lot of it is embedded in. Greek or Roman mythology, just like the idea of Jesus Christ. And, and most of the things them that surround the idea of Jesus Christ is embedded in Greek or Roman mythology. So Medusa got a taste of her own what we call condition where she look and see a reflection. And her reflection was so hideous to her that she herself turned to stone. A serious story. We know that this music did penetrate the hearts and the soul of many, many people all over the world. And the message of Rastafari gets spread all over the world through this music. And meanwhile, the people, them, they are so I say a foolishness. We are say, you know, say, if I will about people, even, especially my, my Christian friend, them, we out there pray for me. If them did just have the sensibility for just examine what we are say, not from where me say on the radio, but where you go, hear me say on the radio, and then you go examine it for yourself. Find books and information outside of the box where you put yourself in it would be a different thing but the refusal of wanting to or the refusal of not wanting 
to expand your brains intellectually and spirituality and spiritually has caused you to box up your mind in a cage that is very difficult to come out of it. That you stay in there and let them clip your wings. You're examining wings. That even when them open the cage door, you still maintain your place in the cage. And most of the people, African people, them get so caged up that when them hear something outside of them belief system, even if the thing can be reasoned out logically and rationally, them, from them rational mind and them logical mind and take on to this craziness of a belief. How can a man see knowledge as stay in front of him and give up knowledge for belief? What kind of man is that? Who allow us as African people to prefer to believe something than to know the something? How knowing takes second place for belief? How can somebody examine something and after examining the something know the something, but refuse to accept the something in the knowing and prefer to accept the thing in the belief. As some serious slave mentality that, you know, <laughs> yeah, as some serious slave mentality there, that them get you to accept a belief than accept a knowing. After you use your intellect, your knowledge, they make you give up your whole brains that you don't ever use one tenth of. That you see the thing as tearing in front of your face. It's like a man stand up on the highway and see a trucker come in front of him, come to him. And the trucker come from the side, see him side of the road with him there. And him stand up there and believe that the truck now lick him. How them get you to believe that? Because. You have precedence and you have history. You have precedence for set and you have history as said, 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 look at all. If you depend on the, if you depend on the white line in the middle of the road, or you depend on the one side of the middle of the road and a truck is coming your way. Really, a truck is coming. You don't stand up there and believe that the truck now will lick you. With your intelligence and your knowing, you come out of the way. You move. So you don't test. You, you don't test. You fear dear so. Some people. I mean, it's it just irrational. It's irrational that somebody guys stand up in front of a truck and believe say it now lick them. Most people don't do that, even though him have a belief system, because rational thinking. Don't step outside when you is faced with a truck a come at you. You don't move your rational thinking and then replace it with a belief when the truck is coming at you. Right? If a truck is coming at you, you use your rational thinking. So, if you use your rational thinking when the truck is coming at you, why is it that we refuse to use rational thinking in other aspect of our life, of things that we think about. People don't, people don't believe. See a truck come and believe, see the truck now lick them. Them take action because knowledge, logics, and rational thinking in the human being, being brains. Tell you, say, you must move. It's not a belief system, tell you that. It's rational thinking. So how come rational thinking can carry in another aspect of your life? If you have two things, and you take away one thing from the two things, where much left? One thing. That is a given. You don't really believe that. That's how you know 
200 dollars and a man take away 100 dollars from you you have 100 dollars left a man owe you 200 dollars and he give you 100 dollars you know him owe you one more 100 dollars that's not belief that is a knowing that is how you use your the capacity as a human being to think and rationalize and comprehend because that is one of the, the the things that separate human beings from just animals we run from four foot we have this capacity that surpasses cows and goats to analyze and rationalize and come to conclusion based upon our logics and knowledge information that is given that is presented so you either use that information to chew away or to incorporate what it is that is necessary to make the thing become justifiable knowing so if a man ever tell you say, why you believe this you know say me believe say if you stand up in front of the truck it now nah, lick you know <laughs> And the truck will come like 70 miles per hour up on the highway. I said, there we are. When truck nearly reached, just run out in front of it. But me said, now nah, lick you, man. God will help you. You believe in that God enough, it's God will save you. Man, if God did not save people from them time, nobody wouldn't dead, man. Believe you me. 